Hello, and welcome to LGBTQ Health Week 5. Today, we'll be discussing the legal and ethical considerations and the provision of LGBTQIA health. So, first things, let's cover a couple learning objectives. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to identify at least three ways that health law and policy can be used to improve LGBTQIA healthcare access and quality to recognize relationships between large scale LGBTQIA social inequality and health disparities, and to highlight the critical roles of data and community engagement to advocate for LGBTQIA health equity, which are all major themes of our class this year, SGM Health as Practice. So um, we're going to, in order today, talk about some different advocacy approaches to talk about federal and then state policies impacting LGBTQIA health, and then to really highlight the ways that both community organizations and in individuals can engage in SGM praxis to improve the health of LGBTQIA populations. So um, first things first, let's have a little bit of a strategy discussion. There are various ways that you can approach advocacy, and obviously these approaches are going to have to parallel the organization of the government if the target of the change management that you're trying to engage in is going to be the changing of law and policy that's governmental. So a civics lesson here, a little refresher, there are three branches of government in the federal government. Um, they are the legislative branch that makes the laws, the executive branch that enforces the laws, and the, the judicial branch that clarifies the law. In terms of how to decide routes for advocacy according to these three branches, um, they, there are trade-offs. So in terms of legislative timeline, it's going to be longer, harder to control. You have to convince many people, multiple elected officials, if you're thinking about the House or the Senate, there are literally hundreds of people that you need to convince. The flip side of that, though, is that legislative change is typically longer lasting or longest lasting. Um, the executive branch is a shorter timeline, typically, to get change made. Um, it's an easier branch to be able to influence because there are fewer people to convince. Uh, in some cases, all you really have to do is to convince the president to sign an executive order, as we'll go over through our conversation today. Um, but the flip side is that if all that's done is an executive order is issued, as soon as the next president takes office, then all the executive orders are, are subject to change. Um, and then finally, we have the judicial branch. It's a very long timeline. It's hard to have any sort of fast action with court cases, especially if you're trying to take a case to the Supreme Court, which has the responsibility of interpreting the federal constitution that, of course, is going to be the highest law of the land and be able to uh, make, in some cases, final interpretations of what laws might mean. Therefore, change is long lasting. However, it's unpredictable um, because Supreme Court justices are appointed for a lifetime at the bench and you just don't necessarily know, you don't have much control about what the justices are going to do. So uh, a lot of the first topic today they're gonna dive into is really a focus on executive change um, in particular and I wanted to go a little bit, though, into administrative law procedures for that reason, because if you're trying to influence the executive branch, one thing that's important to highlight here is everything that's part of that branch. So, of course, it's obvious that the White House would be part of the executive branch, but so are what are called executive agencies, sometimes also called administrative agencies. And um, these agencies, are often discussed as sort of falling in between the legislative and executive types of branches because they engage in rulemaking uh, through formal processes and that those rules um, can't be made without a uh, statutory authorization to fall under from Congress. But then the White House, as was stated previously, decides how to enforce laws. And so there's a bit of a gray zone in terms of um, exactly where it is the authority lie. But they are, these executive administrative agencies include things like all of HHS or Department of Health and Human Services. And the organizations under HHS would include the CDC, the NIH, um, the FDA, 
you know, so these, these large famous institutions that have great impacts on how the federal government would affect health and health policy. Um, as is noted, these administrative agencies can't pass laws, that's the role of Congress, but they do have a variety of ways that they can make um, law-like operations be in place that are in writing and those, the most formal of which I already mentioned, which is administrative rulemaking through notice and comment and through the federal register um, that, that has to take place. And then there's a request for impact information that comes after publication in federal register typically and it's a longer process to actually engage in the formal rulemaking. Another level of administrative, um, I guess, influence or understanding like how to describe the operations that are gonna take place in these executive agencies is, is the issuance of guidance. And so guidance documents are non-binding um, and they are really an example of a tool that if an executive agency might use to inform the public about how they're they're thinking about approaching various topics that fall within their scope of work, and uh, they are non-binding. So technically, it's not as though industry or the public can truly rely on them and say this is the law or anything like that. But they are highly influential because guidance documents are, may explain how the agency is going to interpret rules or regulations in practice and what they may or may not choose to highlight as enforcement priorities, the ways in which, the formats in which they want to receive um, information that they might have statutory authority to collect, that type of thing. Um, and then finally, it's important to note that, uh, of course, executive agencies get to, they do get to decide their programmatic scope of work what they focus on, what they don't, um, what topics they want to bring up and clarify and what the ones they don't, et cetera. They have a lot of latitude in that area. In addition to administrative agencies or executive administrative agencies, there's also executive orders that come out of the White House. The White House can also has broad convening power and they can high, set up task forces, committees, commissions, et cetera, to advise the president, the White House or executive administrative agencies on the ways in which uh, health or health policies should be handled um, and focus in on specific priority populations, that type of thing. Um, these, the convening power of the White House and the executive administration um, is broad. And then finally, as was mentioned, uh, the White House and the federal executive branch can decide to, you know, to enact programs. They can't set, they can't necessarily approach, they can't appropriate a budget that um, Congress has not allocated to them, but they can choose, they, there is latitude of course in how the White House can spend funds uh, to address priorities that it highlights for enforcement or issues that it would like to convene about to raise awareness and to um, influence health and health policy. So. Uh, I want to emphasize again a theme that we have been bringing up throughout the course, which is nothing about us without us. And really to highlight that to the best of my knowledge, no changes are made that I would argue improve health policy or really even general policy at all that affects LGBTQIA people without LGBTQIA people and communities having pushed directly for those changes to take place. Um, and it's really, Therefore, representation really matters, and it's important to think about what representation means because, as we've also really talked about a lot at this point in the class, uh, there are so many different ways that people can be LGBTQIA+, that LGBTQIA plus people can be any race, any ethnicity, any nationality, any age, any, um, you know, obviously sex or gender is written into that, um, sexual orientation, like all of these different things and ability, uh, immigration status, et cetera, all of those things can vary. And the experience of somebody who is a black bisexual transgender immigrant is not going to be the same as a white cisgender, uh, asexual woman, for example. And so it's really important to also highlight this concept even within LGBTQIA community leadership of intersectionality. And when you're thinking about advocacy efforts, who are, what representation is there in pushing for change, even if it's just change that's focused on LGBTQIA issues, you know, how, do, how broadly do you see those issues? And that's why I've included 
this quotation from Mandy Carter at the bottom, which is, is it justice or is it just us? That is the focus of how you're going to view the advocacy platform that you're creating um, in terms of who it applies to, what issues are raised, et cetera. So we've talked a lot at this point too about the bias forest model. I'm not gonna go through it again um, that much today other than to say that it's important um, because of the need to think broadly, intersectionally, inclusively when you're trying to engage in policy change because you don't wanna leave people behind um, that the community stakeholders that individual people and researchers all have unique forms of expertise to contribute and that all of these sources of expertise should be taken into account when translating research to practice and implementation um, of, bio health, of health equity initiatives and LGBTQIA plus community writ large are being undertaken. So at the legislative level, which I said is one of the slowest along the judicial, the slowest levels that you can focus on, um, or sorry, branches that you can focus on at this federal level, um, have been historically focused more on stopping bad initiatives rather than passing good initiatives. Some really important influential examples of legislative actions that have been taken that have affected the health of LGBTQIA people um, include the Patient Perfor Protection and Affordable Care Act, or the ACA, which expanded access, um, it created exchanges to expand access to health insurance because before the uh, ACA was passed, the disparities between LGBTQIA plus people and, and cisgender, cisgender heterosexual people in terms of insurance status were actually much wider than they are today. Um, so I would say even general legislation like the ACA should be evaluated in terms of the effect on health equity um, in marginalized populations, including SGM or LGBTQIA plus populations. The Civil Rights Act of 1984, Title VII as it's called, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. And this we'll see when we get to the judicial section, the US Supreme Court has clarified that the definition of sex actually extends beyond only uh, sex in terms of being viewed as male or female, but extends into uh, gender identity protections, protection um, of transgender people included in that, as well as uh, protections from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Obviously, um, there have been a number of seminal Supreme Court cases that have affected the health and well-being of LGBTQIA plus people, including the United States v. Windsor, which struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, and Obervel v. Hodges, which established marriage equality. The cases I was just talking about that interpreted Title VII's definition of sex included a suite of three cases that are typically just often referred to as Bostic, but also include Altitude Express Incorporated, and as well as the RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes cases. And that is um, the, has been the basis of having the federal protections, uh, anti-discrimination protections on sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, in workplaces, of course, uh, the Title VII doesn't apply to every employer. It's only applying to employers who have 15 employees or more. And obviously there's work that still could be done to on the basis of employment protections. And there's some concerns um, about whether or not religious freedom exceptions will be carved out of anti-discrimination protections. And that's an evolving area of case law. In 2021, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to to grant uh, cert to a case that featured plaintiff Gavin Grimm, who was suing in order to be able to access bathrooms that aligned with Gavin's gender identity and not sex assigned at birth. And this case also is really focused on uh, establishing what Title IX would require to prohibit schools from discriminating on the basis of sex as it came to bathroom usage and relied on BOSAC. And of note, this case was not taken and the court did, the Fourth Circuit did rule in favor of the student. And so that's still, to say that's still in place. Um, in terms of administrative agencies, we talked a little bit about what those different, um, with the different levels of how the executive branch can operate to affect LGBTQI health policy. And there's major areas of action that have uh, have really taken place in terms of what the federal executive branch can do. They tie into employment discrimination, health insurance discrimination, data collection and research, training, as well as many, many convening types of staff, you know, programs, task forces, commissions that have been um, established from 
the, in particular, the Biden administration and the former Obama administration. So, as we said, uh, Bostick expanded, interpreted Title VII such that sex stereotyping was made illegal, and the suite of cases also said it's illegal under Supreme Court uh, under Title VII to be um, discriminating on the basis of not just sex but gender identity and sexual orientation. There have been a series of executive orders that have been issued from the Biden administration that uh, are focused on for anti establishing anti-discrimination protections within the federal government and within educational environments. I'll, and then you can see the link here if you wanna read more about what that looks like. I also wanted to highlight equity action plans, which were established by executive order the first day that President Biden took office and these equity action plans really require federal agencies to um, look through decision-making processes, to think about policy change and actions that they can take to advance equity, um, first of all, on the basis of racial equity, but also thinking about LGBTQIA plus communities and equity. So far, over 90 federal agencies have created plans and the oversight and reporting for this is handled through the Office of Management and Budget and the Domestic Policy Council. Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act um, had a, pro a provision within it that would have banned discrimination on the basis of sex. There are various rulemaking fights that have occurred uh, to clarify what does anti-discrimination look like under the ACA. And that has been, I would say, a lot of the rulemaking there has gone back and forth, but right now what supersedes any of it that will come down is the executive order from President Biden that's really focused on protection uh, and anti-discrimination in various ways that we're talking about, as well as the BASTA case. And then it's notable that in 2014, the Department of Health and Human Services was lifted their gender affirming surgery exclusion. Uh, in June of 2021, the U.S. State Department, because of a lawsuit brought by Lambda Legal, um, stated that it would add an X gender marker to such that people who are non-binary or intersex or gender non-conforming could have an X on their passports, and those continue to be issued today. You can have not just an M or an F, but also an X on your passport. And then in 2016, I wanted to note that Interact, which is an intersex community-based organization that has uh, educational advocacy components to their scope of work, um, they had their uh, big victory when uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services added language to the final rule implementing the ACA's prohibition on sex discrimination to clarify that discrimination on the basis of intersex traits is discrimination on the basis of sex. And so that was the first time that the government acknowledged that legal protections that are focused on sex discrimination also apply to intersex people. In terms of uh, uh, data collection and research, there have been a variety of various uh, sections of various statutes like the Affordable Care Act that, has, that then had a 2011 memo from the then director of the Health and Human Services, uh, Sabalias, to require SOGI data collection. There have been a variety of cultural linguistic um, standards, I can't remember what the A stands for, uh, that have also included uh, appropriate maybe standards and that have protected, you know, have examples to say it's important to include LGBT education uh, in these standards. And then a variety of surveillance surveys that are focused on Describing the health of the U.S. populations have added questions on sexual orientation. Some have added questions on with regard to looking at gender modality or identity, as well as sex assigned at birth. There are also, of course, the NIH has the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office. You read the 2020 Strategic Plan as one of your first assignments for the course this year. And each year, the NIH releases portfolio analyses to look at how funding is being spent on sexual and gender minority health research. And then the Healthy People 2020 and 2030 standards include focused areas for LGBT health. In terms of um, health care provider trainings, so patient-centered patient -centered medical homes and the Affordable Care Act um, should be LGBTI inclusive. SAMHSA and HRSA have 
they issue LGBT Community Health Center grants. HRSA has the National LGBT Health Education Center, which I believe that contract has been at the Fenway Institute for a while. PCORI has funded various trainings and intervention development to improve LGBTI health, as well as the NIH has funded training and intervention developments in LGBTQIA health, and some of which I've even applied for. Um, and they continue to have more growth in these areas in terms of funding over time. There's also a variety of commissions and task forces, as has been mentioned. So the National Resource Commission on LGBT Aging, for example. There's the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which is issued by the White House. There's the National Prevention Council, uh, and that there have been Prevention and Public Health grant grants that have been LGBT inclusive. Then there have been a variety under of White House summits that have focused on LGBTQI communities, including focused on health. Uh, I have been to every single convening that the White House has had on bisexual health, and there have been four so far, so 2013, 15, 16, and 2022. Notice the gap there between 16 and 22. That is because of it, the, whether or not the convenings on these topics are going to occur depends on who is in the White House. And so um, there's also various Ryan White related congressional um, you know, there's a number of, there's funding that's been appropriated by Congress for Rain White, and there's a variety of councils that make sure that people with HIV and, and communities disproportionately impacted by HIV are going to be able to be convened, be at the table to advise on HIV related programs and research. And then finally, Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, also has been convening to determine better ways to address LGBTI health uh, over since at least 2011. So that kind of wraps up our federal discussion in terms of how the legislative, executive, and judicial branches can be engaged in work that affects LGBTQI health and health policy. We're gonna turn it over to the state level policy focus. So first things first, unlike the federal government, which issues one standard for the whole nation, there are 50 states, that means there are 50 legal standards, and that could be true for every single type of issue you can think of under the law. Um, there's more legislative activity because there are 50 states. I mean, obviously, when you look at all of the legislative activity that's going to go on, there's going to be a lot more than uh, what's going on and then in the U.S. Congress alone. Many times states have more hostile and some and also more supportive legislation that's going to go through, which is uh, compared again to the to the federal government. State court rulings are also state courts are distinct from federal courts, and it's no, it's notable that state administrative agency rulings fall under the executive branch. Um, but then are often required to, you know, they're going to go to state court, not federal court a lot of the time if there's going to be uh, challenges, et cetera. And then just like the under the uh, federal government, that the White House is the executive branch and there's these executive administrative agencies that fall under the White House. Um, in states, everything is going to fall under governors in terms of the executive branch. And admit there's going to be these administrative agencies at the state level that in some, in many ways, often parallel those at the federal level. And just like the president can ex issue executive orders from the executive branch in the federal government, governors can also issue executive orders that affect um, state conduct in, at the state level. So just to give a sense, because I can't go through all 50 states in a short lecture like this and what their exact policy environments and law and legal environments are, I wanted to highlight the great work of the LGBT Movement Advancement Project in this area. So uh, LGBT MAP, as you might call it for short, or even just MAP, as well as HRC and a variety of other uh, uh, different LGBT community organizations that have advocacy agendas often do put out maps like this, but I just really like the way that MAP has theirs. So this is the, the main resource that I'm showing in the lectures today. You can see there's a link for every map that is uh, at the bottom of the slide. And so what you're seeing here is a distribution by state of, of bans on transgender students from participating in sports consistent with their gender identity. So, so far, 22 states have passed these bans and 28 states, as well as five territories in Washington, D.C., have not passed these bans. And you can see the distribution 
the band states are in the darker color here. In term, now I want to show a map of states that have on the opposite side passed conversion therapy bans. And so, so far 21 states have banned conversion therapy for minors. Some states have partial bans, about six of them. And then you can see there's the, uh, the lightest color here, this like beige color, had the states that don't have any law or policy on the books. So far that's about 19. So in this case, um, the states that don't have a law, a positive law, are the ones that are in the lightest color. In terms, and same thing, like what are some of the positive laws being passed? So there have been a number of states, 22 states yet again, that have prohibited bullying on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. There are some state, there are zero states that have banned bullying only on the basis of sexual orientation, but two territories that have done so. Um, and then there are 24 states in one territory that have no law protecting LGBTQ students. Um, the states in green in this map have uh, transgender, have, have, have made it, they've banned transgender exclusions and health insurance coverage. So that's 24 states in Washington, D.C. Then they also have, and those are the stars, and then the dark green color would be states that prohibit health insurance discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. You can see various colors in the map that look at whether a state have, has only passed protections on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, or again, that light beige color means the states have passed no protections. This is a map that um, looks at state Medicaid expansion. So again, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, states could choose to expand Medicaid or not. And many states, and so the states in light blue have adopted the expansion, and the states in dark blue have not. And what you'll notice is that there's a pattern that the dark blue states here also tend to be the ones that have not passed protection, positive protections for LGBTQI people. And they also are the ones that often have passed hostile laws that would attack LGBTQI people in various ways. Um, this right here is a map that looks at foster and adoption laws. So dark green states here are going to prohibit discrimination and adoption based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Those that are in the light beige color do not have any protections against discrimination. And then the ones that have sort of the triangle with the exclamation point permit licensed state licensed child welfare agencies to refuse to place and provide services to children and families, including LGBTQ people and same sex couples. Uh, on the basis of religious belief conflict. This right here is non-discrimination laws for housing. Again, dark green is good and the light color is bad. Uh, dark green means that there's protections and the, and the, the light color means no protections for non-discrimination protection in housing. This is non-discrimination protection for public accommodations. So again, dark is good, light is bad. This of course also might be, is going to likely be affected in terms of the effect of the non-discrimination, uh, public accommodations, protections, whether or not they're going to be, how enforceable they are, is going to still be evolving based on the 303 creative case that just came down from the Supreme Court this June. Um, we will see that how uh, that plays out. And then finally, we have uh, bans on best practice medical care for transgender youth. This right here is, an, again, an extremely hot and evolving area. More and more states are banning best practice medication and gender affirming surgical care for transgender youth, although not all bans may yet be in effect. But you can see um, in this case, the dark color is bad. So the state is banning medical care that is medically necessary for transgender youth. And uh, you can see that the red triangle with the exclamation point means that it's actually a felony to provide this care to transgender youth. Um, and then anything, the state that is in the light colors in this case does not ban this care. So that's 30 states, but as of, yeah, as of right now, um, 19 states are, have these bans enacted with some states sort of having intermediary bans that you can read more about at the website link. And finally, just I think it's important to note that overall the number of 
of anti-transgender bills has doubled since 2022. And so what you can see here in this map is the number of anti-transgender bills that have been introduced. And the, one, the dark color here, so you see that with Texas and Missouri, those dark colors means that at least 35 anti-transgender bills have been introduced. And then the check marks um, you can see there indicate that anti-transgender bills have been enacted. So it's really, you can see here that transgender communities are at, at the state level legislatively under attack. Even if the bills aren't passing, the sheer number of bad bills that's being introduced is extremely high. Hundreds and hundreds of these bills have been introduced nationwide. And they, even if the bills are not passed, the fact that they're being introduced and publicized is going to have a negative impact on the mental health of LGBTQIA plus people because it shows a hostile cultural climate uh, that people are taking not just, you know, they're taking it into the, the state level law and policy environment, trying to make turn hatred into the law. Um, and it, it's an onslaught of that right now. So, so this trend, and I guess this topic changes, feels really abrupt after that last slide. I'm just gonna go back and say again, the emotional impact of this is real. And the health impact, like when you have obviously a uh, hostile law, legal system, hostile culture, et cetera, that is going to be um, affecting the mental health of LGBTQIA plus people, then that connects to, you know, you can see the direct connection here in, between anti-LGBT legislation and mental health in LGBT communities. And what my lab really studies is also the relationship uh, between poor mental health and poor physical health. So it's not a, an exaggeration to say that this map has a direct effect on LGBTQI health, because this is looking, even if it's, in, in some cases, it actually is looking at healthcare, like what you're talking about with these anti-trans um, healthcare bills for transgender youth. But in other cases, it's, you know, sports bans or other topics that we were looking at. All of this, though, combines, has a direct effect on the health of LGBT people. And it's a negative effect when you see the nature that the legislation being passed is often uh, it's not just an absence of positive leg legislation, it is the presence of negative legislation. So I guess a better now that I really wanted to acknowledge that now that we've gotten through that, I want to say that part of how we know that there is a negative effect on the health of LGBT population that ties to structural level discrimination through the passage of hostile laws and policies is through data collection. So it's really, it's actually an advocacy issue to even whether or not states allow data collection that would include sexual orientation, sex assigned at birth and gender identity. Um, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system is one of the CDC, I think it is the CDC's largest health surveillance survey that exists. It's also the largest telephone based health surveillance survey in the world. And since 2014, states were able to elect to include an, what was called an optional SOGI module in their BRFIS. So it's just literally the optional module just asks just a handful of questions such that it would be possible to identify LGBT people within BRFIS data. So in 2021, at the last count, with the questionnaires that are publicly available on the CDC's website for BRFIS for that year, 34 states included the optional SOGI module. It's important to note that some states have opted in and out over time. I think there are more than 34 states that have ever asked the SOGI questions. And so even though the survey is telephone based, there's no blood draws, it's 100% self report, it's still a very important source of information to understand basic preventive health care and screening services that people are accessing, asks about health insurance, it asks about um, 
various health behaviors. There's a lot of different data elements within the Burfus Tides of Health that allow for a bigger picture of population health to emerge each year in really in policy important ways. And so the fact that uh, not every state actually has opted to include SOGI, and oftentimes the states that have not included it are gonna be the ones that have the most hostile laws or the worst um, policies on the books that are targeting LGBTQI people and they're the least likely to have the positive bills on file or policies on file to promote the health of LGBT people or protect the health of LGBTQI plus people. Um, it's not a coincidence that the same states that have the bad legislation and the you know, more hostile environments also don't want to count uh, LGBT people because then it's harder to show that the health disparities exist in those states. Now there are some other state, other surveys like the National Health Interviewing Survey uh, National uh, Survey on Family Growth, et cetera, that regardless of uh, whether there's not like an option for a state to reject having questions that tie to SOGI in those surveys. So we have other ways to look at the data, but the Burfus is really powerful just because it has the largest numbers and the most statistical power, therefore, to understand the health of LGBT people, especially at the intersections when you're thinking about race, ability, uh, income, et cetera, other social determinants. But um, yeah, so to understand and document this, the impact of policy on health, we do need data collection in place, which is why it's another core advocacy issue that I wanted to include in our talk today. So uh, I think when we get into class, we, can, we will talk through some of these questions, but I just wanted to highlight now that it's important to view uh, in, our, in our theme of SGM health as praxis in our class, it's important to realize that every person can make a difference. And indeed, the, the slide that we had around about bias, you know, nothing about us without us or bias for us, those slides, they really emphasize for a reason that the people who are making changes happen that are going to fight back against the bad bills and pass the good ones are LGBTQI plus people and community organizations. So I think it's important. I want people to take away from this lecture in this class that you it, it you can make a difference and make an impact but by monitoring the state and local level bills the federal bills and legislation what the governor is doing what the president is doing what task forces and commissions exist that have the ability to affect lgbtqia plus health and then you can think about what actions you have taken have you contacted your representatives have you try to become a member of some of these task forces? Are you part of a community organization that engages in advocacy or supports those that do? And on a basic level, can, do you know the names of your federal and state legislators? Um, these are all things that you can think about doing that have the power to affect health in SGM communities. So uh, on that note, in terms of how do you know where to get started? So this is a list of just a handful of national LGBTQIA plus organizations that do have political and community advocacy components to their work uh, or have engaged in, um, some of them have actual full-time paid staff that are got political and governmental affairs, lobbyists, et cetera. Others uh, are people that are, you know, that have no paid staff, like Avon has no paid staff, for example, but still engages in significant advocacy work so one thing we'll show here in a second is that the leaders of AVEN actually were successful in carving out an exception for hypoactive sexual desire disorder and for um, female sexual arousal disorder. I, I'd have to look at the FSFI, I'd have to look at the name of that again, but saying that if you're asexual, that that is not, should not be deemed a mental health disorder under the DSM. So, I mean, there's different ways in which these community organizations are engaging in advocacy, some of them very formally trying to change federal and state uh, policy and laws, others more working through coalition and partnership with each other in this list to try to do everything possible to improve the health of their communities and populations. Uh, there's also a variety of professional organizations that have advocacy components to them. So these are still community-based, but they are often community-based organizations that are representing a certain group of people by profession. So for example, the American Psychological Association, the American Medical Association, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, 
et cetera. Um, and so you can also join these organizations, become members, attend conferences, and you don't necessarily have to be, um, I'm a member, I've been a member of GLAMA and I'm certainly not a healthcare provider, I'm a researcher, but even so, I'm still been a member and I presented at their conference to try to address in that case, what I'm presenting on at GLAMA is often bisexual health and, and health advocacy issues. In academia, there's also ways to get involved if you're thinking about the research angle of how can research get translated into policy. So obviously there's the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing at Northwestern or ISTEM, which I am core faculty and director program in that is focused very heavily on translating research into advocacy uh, initiatives as well as to healthcare change and practice to improve the quality of healthcare received by LGBTQA plus patients. There are a variety of, of other academic institutions around the country that have similar initiatives, and a few of them are listed here. This is the reference that I was talking about with asexuality in the DSM-5, um, you know, in the differential diagnosis sections, carving out and saying that asexual is not going to, uh, being asexual alone does not mean that you would be receiving a mental health diagnosis. Yeah. Um, leadership and representation matter. And I think in terms of if you're a researcher, what are some ways you can also show up? Definitely be thinking about using community-led or community-based participatory research designs, which we talked about community-engaged research in the last class. Um, I would encourage people to engage in advocacy coalitions. If people want to talk to me about what are some different coalitions that can be joined in Illinois, in last class, we all had the fantastic opportunity to meet Kim Hunt, and who is a mover and shaker and has helped pass many laws within Illinois that are pro-LGBT uh, positive change types of legislation. Um, you can write op-eds, you can write policy briefs, you can engage in social media in various ways to make your views known or to support or boost campaigns and hashtags that are focused on positive uh, efforts to improve LGBTQI health and pass good laws and policies. As a healthcare provider, you can provide high quality, culturally responsive care for your patients. You can get yourself trained in LGBTI healthcare and like the basics of LGBTI populations, QI populations, like, you know, you're in this class, I guess, you're doing that now. Um, you can help be, be, you know, get trained the trainers and, and go on and give these trainings yourself. You can join professional societies. You can get join the board of directors of different LGBT and HIV related community organizations. And I'm just curious, like we'll be talking in class, like what are things that you have done? What else can you think of to do? And so overall, hopefully by the end of the conversation or lecture just now, um, you'll be able to identify at least three ways that health on policy can improve LGBTQI healthcare access and quality to, uh, again, see the direct relationship between social inequity and health disparities, um, you know, thinking structurally through at the law and policy level and the relationship to health, and then describe the role of data and community engagement to advocate for LGBTQI health equity. And with that, um, when we get to class, I will be very happy to take questions and, and excited to build a, a conversation with you about some of the concepts in our, the lecture here today. Thank you.